your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's the one. Who's in us greater is the one who calls our name. He will never fail. Stronger is the one within us. Stronger is the one who fights for us. He will never fail. You will never fail. For your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Open up our eyes, surround us with your light. Your love endures forever. And mighty is no one who's for us. Mighty is the one who's strong to save. He will make a way. You will make a way. For your love endures forever. Oh, your love endures forever. Open up our eyes. Surround us with your light, your love endures forever. Our God is fighting for us always. Our God is fighting for us all. Our God is fighting for us always. We are not alone. We are not alone. Our God is fighting for us always. Our God is fighting for us all. Our God is fighting for us always. We are not alone. We are not alone. For your love endures forever. us with your light, your love endures forever, oh, your love endures forever, oh, your love endures forever, open up our eyes, surround us with your light, your love endures forever. And open up our eyes, surround us with your light, your love endures forever. Praise God. Aren't you glad that his love endures forever? Hallelujah. Before we do anything else today, we want to take advantage of this opportunity to pray for those that are affected by the hurricane and all of the weather that's going on from Hurricane Harvey, I'm so happy that our president met with leaders the other day and declared a national day of prayer to pray. You can send all the relief you want. You can do all the things in the natural. But if the Lord's not in it, it's just not going to work. Could we join with our president, with leaders, with churches around the, the world right now 
and let's go to prayer. Could you join hands with believers on your right hand, on your left, and let's go before the Lord interceding for those in, that have been affected adversely by this, this hurricane and the spin-off tornadoes and the weather and all the flooding. People that have lost everything except their lives and we want to place them in the hands of the Lord. Pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we are mindful that though the enemy would use this as an opportunity to destroy, we ask, Father God, that you in your power and might would use this as an opportunity to gather people's attention heavenward. That as people around the, the country today begin to lift up our brothers and sisters, those in need in Texas and Louisiana and Florida and other places, that, Father God, you would bathe this in your presence. And there wouldn't just be a relief effort. There would be a mighty move of your Spirit in the place that people's attention would be gone, drawn to the Lord their God. That, Father, those that have drifted from you, those that don't want anything to do with you, will see the love of God expressed by the people of God and we ask for your Holy Spirit to use this as an opportunity to open hearts, to open lives, and receive you. If even one calls out upon the name of the Lord, we know you will hear and you will answer. We pray, Father, that as we make investment as well in, in the recovery effort, that we're not just given a cup of cold water, but we're giving it in your name. We ask, Father, for you to take that and use it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated just for a couple seconds, and then we're going to have a time of fellowship. But we want you to be aware that in the offering today, if you would like to donate towards the recovery effort, the Assemblies of God has a phenomenal outreach ministry called Convoy of Hope. And if you've seen any news coverage at all, in the background, you've seen some Convoy of Hope trucks. And we're giving out supplies, but we're giving it out in Christ's name. And if you want to be a part of that, you can be assured no scams attached to this. Every dollar, every dime that's going in that direction is going to make it to that destination. On your offering envelope or on a check or whatever, if you simply mark hope. It will send it off to Convoy of Hope as soon as we get the, the proceeds counted and that money will be rushed to assist those that are recovering from this disaster. We also want to welcome everyone if you're a guest with us here today at Trinity welcome home. We want you to kick back and feel at home. Uh, we have a lot of our people during this. I hope this is the last weekend for the, the vacations and stuff. Because we got people scattered all over creation. But uh, you're here, and we're happy to have you. If you're a guest with us today, if you'd reach in front of you at the seat in front, there's a little card called a connections card. We'd like to connect with you and invite you to fill that out. And you can take it with, with you during the fellowship time or drop it in the offering plate later on in the service. If you take it during the fellowship time to the back, we're going to have, if you... Deposit that back with Mike, and uh, we'll have a free coffee mug for you. And so we, we invite you to just fellowship. Welcome home to Trinity. Right now we're going to take some opportunity to praise the Lord by fellowship. And we're going to uh, invite you to stand, go out from where you are, and greet one another. You may be talking to someone, this is their first time here. And be sure and talk to this brother back here. Our brother from Pontiac, Michigan. Illinois. I thought you were from Michigan. Well, well, my goodness gracious. Well, but my brother shared his testimony. Years ago, he walked into church because of an invitation. Don't start fellowshipping yet. 
Sit down, Jim. My goodness. He, invite, he was invited to come to church. He was an atheist. Had no use for God. But he responded to a simple invitation. How important it is. And it wasn't very long until he gave his heart to the Lord. And just overflowing with joy in the Lord. Be sure and get to meet him. And others settled around here today. We want you to just fellowship and greet one another. Now you can stand up. Now you can move out. You can have a half piece from my purse. That's it. Only you. Just you. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together. We're going to continue to worship the Lord.
The brethren are going to be up around the altar to pray for you if you have a need, if you have something going on in your life, you need prayer. You don't have to wait till the end of the service. You can come right now and they'll anoint you with oil and believe God for the miracle in your life. If you just want to come and, and pray for others, that's great too. We're going to be singing some old an old song right now that I dearly love. It tells a simple story. There's a blessed time that's coming, coming soon. It may be evening, morning, night, or noon. The wedding of the bride united with the groom. And we shall see the king when he comes. Are you ready to praise him today? The king's coming, amen? Let's sing about it. There's a blessed time that's coming, 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 coming soon. And it may be evening, evening morning, morning, or at noon. Tell me a wedding of the bride united with the groom. And we shall see the king when. We shall see the King. We shall see the King. We shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in power. We'll have the blessed hour. We shall see the King when He comes. Are you ready? Should the Savior call today? When Jesus said, well done, don't go away. He's built a home for the pure, the vow can never stay. We shall see the King when He comes. We shall see the King. We shall see the King. We shall see the King when He comes. He is coming in power, we'll wear the blessed hour, we shall see the King when He comes. Hallelujah. Oh, my brother, are you ready for the call? To crown your Savior, King and Lord of all, and all the kingdoms of this world shall soon before Him fall. And we shall see the King when He comes. We shall see the King. We shall see the King. We shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in power. We'll have the blessed hour. We shall see the King when He comes. We shall see the King. We shall see the King. We shall see the King when He comes. He's coming in power. We'll have the blessed hour. And we shall see the King when He comes. Do you believe it? Oh, give Him some praise. Hallelujah.
heaven is trembling in all of your wonders. The kings and their kingdoms are standing amazed. Here in your presence, we are Your presence, heaven and earth become one. Here in your presence, all things are new. Here in your presence, everything bows before you. your hands fullness of joy every fear suddenly wiped away here in your presence all of my gains now fade away every crown no longer on display Your presence. 
the name of the Lord. Holy is His name. Oh, glory to His name. Under his shadow, the shadow of the Almighty, under the cloud of his glory, the Lord has designed that you would abide. Step into his presence. Acknowledge the glory of the Lord. Walk in his presence. Fellowship with the one who created, the one who lives, the one who gives life. But worship the one who gives life eternal through his son, Jesus. Step under the cloud, child of God, and find provision. Step under the cloud and find strength. Step under the cloud and find rest in weary times. For the Lord truly is wonderful and glorious and greatly to be praised.
rain of your love. We feel the wind of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven, let us hear. We feel the rain of your love. We feel the wind of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of heaven, let us hear. Thank you, worship team. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the ushers are gathering now. We're going to be receiving our tithes and our offerings. And if you have a special offering to send towards the recovery effort through Convoy of Hope, uh, be sure and mark that specifically on your envelope or your check. I want to remind you of some of the things that are coming up. Next Sunday evening, we're launching back our Sunday evening services. We took the summer off because so many of you took the summer out. <laughs> and uh, it just me and me and Tom and, and a couple of we were going to be here. But, uh, so we're launching back, and we have special guests, uh, Blaine and Christine Bowman, and they're coming to share music and testimony and song and the preaching of the Word. And you're going to enjoy them. They're just neat people. And they're coming to share the gospel message with you. And then in the following Sunday evenings, we're launching a series on fighting the good fight of faith. And uh, so we want you to uh, give us a try on Sunday nights. Would you do so? And uh, it's another opportunity to share together 
to. We're going to hear some powerful testimonies. We're going to be singing praise to the Lord. We're going to be worshiping. We're going to be investing ourselves in growing in the Lord. And so Sunday's a, Sunday night's a great time to come and share, starting next Sunday night as we launch, relaunch the Sunday evening services. There's all kind of announcements in the bulletin. There's all kinds of things to sign up for at the information desk in the south lobby. And uh, I know some of you ladies have been waiting on this. <clears throat> the second annual Trinity Flag Football Championship. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can sign up for that too. And uh, all kinds of things. Uh, we're having a special men's ministry gathering at Don Perry's. Uh, it'll be 1 o'clock uh, on September 30th at his place, and we'll get you a map and directions. We're going to be sharing down there. He always invites his neighbors in and relatives, and just to have an opportunity to impact uh, friends and family. And we're going to be sharing a special drama that day. He's asked us to come down and bring somebody in my suitcase. Uh, we're going to be sharing about Abraham and uh, an exciting story of Abraham in drama. So you can sign up for that, guys, and, and uh, we encourage you to be a part of that. All right. Lots of other things to sign up for and be a part of. But right now, we're going to give our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. And we're going to find out who's supposed to pray for us today. And they're not here. All right. Well, I'll pray. I'll pray. We had a great time at the Creation Museum yesterday. And some of them didn't survive. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> we had around 30-some folk went down, and we had a phenomenal time. And uh, I encourage you to, to make your way down there. Some have already made plans to go back. And in the next month or so, we're going to plan on going to the Ark Encounter down there. And you'll want to sign up for that as soon as we have the details. Let's pray over the offering today. Father God, you are so good to us. Your blessings are without number. We try to list them. They're like the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. But Father God, we thank you that you bless us, but you even bless us more as we participate in your plan for the kingdom. We bring our gifts today, Father, our tithes, our offerings, our love gifts to you, because we want people to know there is salvation in the name of God of the Lord. There is hope and help in your name. And we give so that these doors can remain open and the lights can be on so that we can shout the praises here in this part of Columbus. But also, Father, we send money around the world so that your missionaries can share the story. We ask, Father, your blessing upon this time of ministry as we minister back to you in praise through our giving. Bless each gift. Bless each giver. And bless those that will be the recipients. In Jesus' name, amen. two or three tracks that takes a long lead in for them. This song is taken from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, I believe it's the 47th chapter with the 15th verse. As I look around at these 
dismissed they already left but I'll, I'll dismiss them anyway kids are dis dismissed to go to their classes and uh, the lifesavers children oh they hadn't left okay praise God today is a very special day the first Sunday of every month we set aside to remember the Lord's sacrifice at Calvary. At the conclusion of the service, we'll be 
sharing in the Lord's Supper, the, the bread and the cup. But the Lord impressed me today that he wants us to take the message today to focus upon that event and what it means. I do not want to ever be guilty of just going through the motions. Amen. Well, we got ourselves a ritual here. We're going to celebrate. Nah, nah. It's more than that. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and beginning with verse number 23. I encourage you once again, do not just listen to the word being read. I want you to participate with me in praising God, in shouting the glories of God when we read what it says. And to, sometimes you say amen, sometimes you say oh me, oh my. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and beginning with verse 23. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. We've been singing about that today. Sherm sang about it. We sang about it the king's coming. You see, he is coming again. And there's something we're to be doing till he comes back. Verse 27, therefore, based on this, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or are dead. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Father God, as we walk through this word that you spoke through Paul to believers centuries ago, speak it fresh to our hearts today that we might answer the question, are we worthy? to eat the bread and drink the cup. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Please keep your Bibles open to this portion of God's Word. On this first Sunday, we'll be remembering. So let me, let me uh, help you remember something else. The service isn't over until we've come to the Lord's table today. You say, well, you know, I've got appointments. How many of you have ever gone to a doctor's office and waited long past your appointed time? Anybody here? I mean, it's just a vague estimate, isn't it? I'm supposed to be here. When I went in for the cataract surgery a couple weeks ago, they said, be there at 815. Well, you know me, I, I had to be there earlier, and which meant Linda had to drive me earlier, and we sat and sat and sat and sat and sat and sat. Well, I, I paced. But, but uh, it wasn't a good hour. Over an hour later. So you may have an appointment, 
But you know what? What we're going to be talking about is worth the wait. Because Jesus died for it. For you. And for me. So don't cut out early. I'm trying to lay enough guilt on you. that <laughs> I want you to see the importance of it. It's not just another ritual. It's not just another thing, churchy thing we do. If it is, we're doing it all wrong. We'll be taking the bread and the cup, giving thanks for the act of God through Jesus on the cross. That's what the church is really all about. That Jesus died for our sins. And if we ask him, he will take that sin account and wash it away completely. Have you had that done? Have you invited the Lord to wash your sins away? He paid the price, but we have to ask for him to apply it to our account. True. Yesterday we went down to the Creation Museum and I had called ahead and I had paid for all the tickets on a credit card. But you know what? When we got there, they weren't going to let us in until we had personally accessed what had been purchased for us. The same thing with salvation. Some people say, well, Jesus died, it's all taken care of. Yes, if we access what he did for us, personally. You can't do it for somebody else. A church can't do it for you. A, a little water on your forehead as an infant can't do it for you. You have to invite him to pay your account, and he will. It's not to be taken lightly, though. It's very clear from what we read here. It is not to be taken as just a thing we do, going through the motions. You see, the Corinthian church that this was written to had a lot of issues. They had a lot of problems. Um, Wednesday mornings, uh, oh, about a year ago, we were doing the, the Corinthian letters, and uh, my goodness gracious, those people had issues. They had problems. I went back over and looked. In, in the, up until we're looking at this 11th chapter, there have been over 30 things the Holy Spirit through Paul had to deal with that were wrong in the Corinthian church. That's a whole lot of wrong, amen? They started off bickering with each other, and he talked with them about it. Bickering and fussing and fighting with each other. They, he went on, and very early in the letter, he says, you know, you've got some really bad immorality stuff going on in your church. And not only that, you, you've got gross immorality, and then you've got uh, adultery going on, and you've got incest going on, and worse than that, you're not even doing anything about it. You're letting them still have a leadership position. Whoops. They're still involved in positions of leadership. They had messed up teaching, messed up doctrines. They were just a mess. By the time Paul's writing this, he has dealt with so much stuff let me stop just a moment. Sometimes when I'm feeling a little discouraged, a little down, when problems hit the church, and they all, they hit the church, let's face it. Oh, my. What are you going to do with Trinity, Lord? And he inspires me to read Corinthians. Tells me several things. There's some churches are more messed up than we are. <laughs> you know, there's even some people more messed up than you and me. But God is invested in healing his church. He's invested in correcting what's wrong. He doesn't just say, well, enough of that. I'm tired of the church. I'm tired of, of trying to mess with them. No, it is the bride of Christ, and Jesus is going to do whatever he can do. He will empower, he will infuse power to correct the messes in his church. 
because he gave himself for it. And he's waiting on the wedding celebration that's coming up in the future. The wedding in heaven. God doesn't give up easily on his church. Can you praise him for it? The believers at Corinth Assembly, not only had they done all that other junk we were talking about, I mean, when you read it page by page, they were really seriously messed up. But we get up to the 11th chapter, and you say, well, what can they do wrong with Holy Communion? I mean, they meet together. You remember what Jesus, he gave his body to be broken. His hands were nailed. The blood was shed. It's so clear. How could they mess that up? How many of you know somebody can mess something up even if they're not even trying to? The Corinthian believers had it down pat. They said, well, you know, we're having this celebration to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And, you know, some of the Jews in the congregation told them, well, it's all a part of our Passover celebration. And they said, well, let's just go ahead and have a big meal. And we'll have a carrion dinner, and we'll have a potluck dinner, and we'll, we'll, we'll just have a wonderful time. And the Corinthian church, rather than focusing upon what Jesus said to remember and focus upon, they're focused upon who's going through the line first for the big buffet table. They're feasting, and they're pushing and shoving, and, and if somebody got there late, they didn't get anything. That's the reason I started going in the line first around here because so is. And Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is saying that's not the way it's supposed. It's not about you feeding your face. It's about you feeding your faith. And finding out what the real purpose and meaning of Jesus coming is all about. He said, that which I received from the Lord. Verse 23. It's not from hearsay. God, the Lord Almighty God, spoke this into the heart of Paul to write to the Corinthians. It's not hearsay. It's first hand from the Father. That which I receive from the Lord, I have declared to you. I want you to know that we're not getting secondhand revelation here. God is still wanting to reveal who he is and the purpose and significance of what we're going to be doing today. Jesus explained it to Paul. Paul was steeped in knowledge of the Jewish traditions and customs. He'd been to Passover celebrations ever since he was a little kid. He'd asked the questions in the Passover meal. He had been there to all the things that they did, all the songs that they sang, the unleavened bread, the, the blood of the lamb, all of these kind of things. But he didn't know what it meant until Jesus explained it to him. And he said, I've received this from the Lord, and I'm declaring it to you. And he said, this is so important, you're to keep remembering it, the bread and the cup, until I come again, till Jesus comes again. Again, we sang about that, until Jesus comes back, and he has not returned yet, in case you wondered. He hasn't come back. There's all kinds of wacko teachings out there. I haven't heard one yet this year but about, well, he's coming on, you know, June 15th or something. Uh, there's usually at least once a year some nut job gets out there and says, well, I know, I figured out mathematically when Jesus is coming back. Mark it down. They're nuts. It's false teaching. The angels don't even know. You're not smarter than angels, are you? You see, he's coming again, but he hasn't come back yet. It is an established reality. Jesus Christ is coming again. He's going to come. He's going to go out with a shout from heaven, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ 
will be reinfused with the spirit that went to be with the Lord when they died. They're going to come back and they're going to rise first. Then those who are alive are going to be instantaneously transformed, metamorphosized. We shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, into a glorified body that can reside in, in heaven and walk on streets of gold and not fall through. But it hasn't happened yet. It could happen at any moment. But until it does, until the trumpet sounds, or until we pass through the doorway of death, we're to keep remembering what it's all about. That's what we're going to do, be doing today at the conclusion of the service because he's coming again. The church needs to be continually reminded what we're here for. We're not here to be a social club. We're not here to be popular. We're not here to win friends and influence people except when we're influencing them and pointing them towards Jesus Christ. Till he comes back to us, we're to be remembering why he died for us. What the significance about this event really is. And at, every time we get an opportunity, we're to refresh our recollection of what happened. The Corinthians had forgotten the reason for the remembrance. The, uh, they were feasting, but they were still forgetting what it was all about. Paul says, I got this directly from the Lord. I'm sharing it with you but it doesn't stop there. He says, you know, how the Lord, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. We all know that it was the, the bread, the, the hidden bread of the afikomen that's in the part of the, the celebration of the Passover meal. It's taken out first at the first part of the meal. It's broken, wrapped in linen, hidden. Jesus took it out and said, you want to know what this is all about? You've been doing this ritual. You've been going through the motions all these thousands of years since the Passover in Egypt. I want to explain what this is. And he unwrapped that piece of broken, pierced bread. Unleavened, no sin in it. No leaven of sin. He says, this, folks, is my body. Broken for you. And then Jesus took the cup after the meal, it says. The third cup. After the Passover meal was completed, he took the third cup and he says, you want to know what this is? This cup, the cup that's called the cup of remembrance, the cup where the scripture is read with it, I have redeemed you with outstretched arms. He said, you want to know what that cup means? He says, that cup is my blood. His arms would be outstretched in just a few hours from then. He would die on the cross. His blood would be shed. He says, this cup is talking about that event. But it doesn't stop there with explaining about the body, the bread, symbolism of body and bread, and the symbol of the fruit of the vine and the the cup and his blood. He goes on and says, therefore, verse 27, whoever, how many of you are a whoever? Yeah, every one of us is a whoever. Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Hmm. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner or as the King James says, unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body in this act. The Holy Spirit slaps us with the reality. This is serious stuff. This is not just something you do well, I've always had communion. I've always done it. No. Nah. We need to wake up and examine what it's all about. Unworthy. Unworthy manner. We better find out what this means, amen? I don't, I don't want to mess up by mistake. 
I don't want to do something that condemns me or that causes me to be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus. So I need to find out about this. We all do. In the Greek, the word there is anaxos, and it means not worthy or not entitled to or irreverent. Just kind of passing it off. We see this word in other contexts in other places in the Scripture. The root of that word is in the same thing that John the Baptist said. They were saying, are you the Messiah? Oh, no, 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 no. There's one coming after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to unleash. And when he comes, He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John was saying, I am not worthy to even untie his shoe. It's talking about not being entitled to. Well, John was a great preacher of righteousness. John, Jesus said it himself. He was the, the greatest man born of woman. He was a, a preacher. He stood up against the king of his day. He wasn't worthy? No. John knew he was not worthy of even untying the shoes or tying them of Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 says, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This is Jesus' words. And we're not to eat this bread or drink this cup unworthily or in an unworthy manner. You know another place where this, there's hundreds of places where this unworthy is found. But you know it in Luke chapter 15. Jesus has been telling stories about lost coins, lost sheep, and he comes down to, man had two sons. And one of them said, give me what's coming to me, what I'm entitled to. And he gave him everything he was entitled to, and it says he left and he went to a far country, and there he wasted everything he was entitled to, with riotous, lustful living. We find out by the testimony of his older brother, he was going to prostitutes and everything else. It was a total immoral behavior, and, and, and he lost it all, what he was entitled to. And then one day when he was, had nothing left, and he's so hungry, he's looking across and He's gone to doing the worst thing a little Jewish boy can do. He's feeding the hogs. And they're not allowed to eat that stuff. And there's a big old sow looking across to the mud pen from him. And the sow is gobbling down some slop. And, and he was halfway to reach him and say, that looks good. You know, when you sacrificed everything, bad things can start to look good. And then it says he came to himself. Amen? He came to himself. And he said, this is stupid. Well, that's not what he, he came to himself. And literally what he said, this is stupid. I'm sitting here ready to slop germs with a, with a pig and, and my thought, in my thought, the servants eat better than because I will arise, and I will go to my Father, and I will say to my Father, get it? I will say to my Father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Unworthy. Do not eat this bread or drink this cup in an unworthy manner. It's dangerous.
to participate in this as just a ritual. I know thousands, millions of people do it, but it doesn't make it any less dangerous. We confess our sins to Jesus. He washes them all away. The sins are gone, gone, separated as far as the east is from the west, remembered against us no more. But does that mean we're worthy? Uh, not necessarily. I know, how many of you watched some football games yesterday or maybe Thursday night? <laughs> oh my. They'd take my heart medicine for some of those OSU games. <clears throat> now, I've, I've been a fan for a long time of OSU football, but if I, and Andy, this applies to you in West Virginia, you know, well, I'll just use you since I'm tired of using me. I'll just use Andy. Now, he's a big, you've been a fan of West Virginia football for years and years and years and years. And Andy, because he's been a fan, he could go to the stadium and he could walk up and say, I'm Andy Burner. I have been a fan for years. I'd like to sit in the best box that you have up there, reserved for the, the, the people that have put all the millions of dollars into this complex. I, I've been a fan. Can I, can I have my seat now? I'm so, sorry, sir. Andy, you are not entitled to sit in that seat. You, you are not entitled. You can have the tie on and everything, and you're not entitled. But, but I, I've always been a fan. Doesn't make you entitled. Doesn't make you entitled. Uh, well, but, but I'm here. Doesn't make you entitled. Well, I've done many good things. I have, I have put decals on my car about this football program. Amen? I've told people about the Mountaineers. Sorry, sir, that does not make you entitled. Somebody comes down from the upper decks and says, is that in? Yeah. He's been trying to get in here. We told him he's not entitled. He says, no. I have here a pass for him. And though he, by his own efforts, is not entitled to sit in the box seat, my invitation to him entitled. There's nothing you and I can do to be worthy of what Jesus did for us. There's no act that we can do. Well, I've always gone to church. That does not entitle you to sit at the table of the Lord. That seat at the table of the Lord, you're not entitled to receive it. Well, I've done good things. I, I've done all these wonderful things. I have given money to the poor. I have helped people out. I've attended church. I've sung. I've, I've done all kinds of things. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, ma'am. Nothing you can do, nothing I can do entitles me. But if Jesus invites me to sit there, because of what he did for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a seat at the table yeah. for me. Yeah. There's a seat yeah. at the table yeah. for you. There you are entitled not because of what you have done, but what has been done in your behalf. Can you give a shout to the Lord if you've had your sins washed away? Can you give a shout to the Lord if you've allowed him to cleanse the sin away that he's invited you into close fellowship. You're not just somebody out there that wants to get in. You've been invited in. Hallelujah. 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 You are not worthy. I am not worthy because of anything of me. I am not entitled because of anything that I've done. I may have done some great things. Billy Graham could stand up and say, well, I'm, I'm entitled, but he wouldn't do that no. because he knows. No. 
Nothing. Nothing that we can do or have done or ever will do entitles us to come, take the bread and the cup. But you have been invited. You invited to the table the King of glory, Almighty God, because of what he did. Father, I've got a reserved seat. I've got a reserved seat for that one. I've got a reserved place. They can take the bread that reminds of my broken body. They can drink the cup that reminds that my blood was shed, not because of what they did, but what I did in their behalf. You so loved the world that you gave the, your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's a place at the table. Not because of my entitlement, but because of his mercy, his yeah. grace, yeah. his sacrifice. I was troubled the other day. Have you ever had a song rolling through your head and just could not remember all the words to it? <laughs> I put it on Facebook and I got several answers and praise God some of them knew what they were talking about. I remember years ago going to a Billy Graham crusade. George Beverly Shea stood, stood up to the microphone and he sang this song. It's written in 1948 by Beatrice Bixler. I am not worthy the least of his favor, but Jesus left heaven for me. He died on the cross to be my savior. I am not worthy. This dull tongue repeats it. I am not worthy, this heart gladly beats it. Jesus left heaven to die in my place. What mercy, what love, and what grace. We're not worthy, folks. So how, how can we go? How can, it says, if that person eats the bread or drinks the cup unworthily or in an unworthy manner, if we believe we're entitled to it, we are unworthy. But if we're responding to his invitation, my child, come and remember what I did for you. You weren't there, but I was there in your behalf, says Jesus. Amen. No, I am not worthy, but Jesus has extended the invitation to me and to you by what he did. He deems me worthy because my sins which would keep me away have been taken away themselves. I can sit at the table. Amen. The second aspect, though, of eating and drinking unworthily has to do with our focus. In an unworthy manner, irreverently, just kind of taking it for granted. I was thinking about this the other day. Have you ever gone into a restaurant and you had a waiter or waitress that really didn't care anything about you? You were more of a bother. How many of you have ever felt like you were an inconvenience? Yeah. Let me paint a little scenario. I've actually had this happen. Maybe you have too. You sit down and, well, you came in and hit, over there. You know, oh, I feel welcome already. <laughs> and then you're killing time waiting on, they finally come over. They're having a little conversation in the back and they're talking and about all these kinds of things. And you wait, okay, okay. So they eventually come over, right? And he says, what do you have? Oh, it's, you just feel so welcome. You feel so good. Yes, I will have the cheeseburger plain. How many of you know that's the kiss of death? Right there. I will have the cheeseburger plain with fries 
and a large black coffee. <laughs> and the question follows, to let you know that this waiter or waitress does not have a clue and is not interested in you at all. When they say, you want cheese on that hamburger? <laughs> yes. Would you like fries with that? I said that. <laughs> what do you want on your, your cheeseburger? I said, I want it plain. You don't want cheese on it? <laughs> I've had this conversation. How many of you have had a conversation like this? And you want cream and sugar in your coffee? In my black coffee? And then the worst part is, you get your order. And I have a cheeseburger with everything on it, no fries and a coffee with 10 creams in it. <laughs> that waiter, that waitress, was distracted on other things. Their focus was not upon being served. It was not upon the, the issue at hand. And folks, we cannot afford to approach the Lord's table, even though he has called us worthy. We cannot afford to approach the Lord's table in an unworthy way irreverent manner. Could you imagine? Use your imagination. You say, well, I don't have an imagination. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you do. You looked in the mirror this morning and said, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Couldn't pass that. Could you imagine with me? A long, long table. Places prepared with the bread to remind us of his broken body and the cup to remind us of his shed blood. But Jesus is at the table. If Jesus is walking the aisles today, ready to bring you to the table, Where's your thoughts? What are you thinking about? What, what's running through your mind? Some are scrolling through phones. Well, it's not making any noise. I'm texting. Jesus must be so thrilled to know that. Jesus, a text is more important and giving reverence to what you did for me. Yeah. Hmm. You say, well, I would never say that. No, but you do it. Folks, we need to be cautious lest coming to the Lord's table we forget what it's all about. We do not want to Take the bread in an unworthy or an irreverent manner. We don't want to suggest that, well, I'm just going through the motions. We do this every month, uh, yada, yada, yada. No, he says, when you do this, you need to discern Jesus' body and blood were laid on the line for you. And in honor and respect to him, you focus in on it. Because this is the opportunity for the church, for believers, at least once a month, if not more, to garner our focus of what we're to be about. It's all about Jesus. It's all about reaching people with the good news. You can be born again. It's all about giving people the knowledge you're not worthy but he wants you to come because he is worthy. And isn't that what the, the saints all gather around the throne one day and sing? 
Revelation tells us that's exactly the case in Revelation chapter 4. What do they say? Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power because of what you did for us. At that point, the, the crowns of glory that have been given you, a soul winner's crown that has been given you, the crown of life that has given you as a believer, you've passed from death unto life in heaven, and he gives you a crown. And all the believers around the throne have these crowns that are symbols. We've made it through. We're in heaven. But as they begin to praise the name of the Lord and as the winged creatures say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. All of the 24 elders and all the thrones of heaven take those crowns and say, I don't deserve this. You are worthy. And they cast their crowns at his feet. He is the worthy one. Let a person examine themselves so that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we don't do it as if we're entitled. Well, I'm a good person. I give so much. I do so much. I, I've been a nice guy, a nice gal. I, I, I just, I'm just a phenomenal person. Everybody calls me friends. I have 5,000 likes on Facebook. I must be wonderful. But you know what? It's nothing to do with that. You and I are not worthy. The least of his favor. But Jesus left heaven. He's the worthy one. And when we come to the Lord's table, not because of our worthiness, but because of what he's done for us, he extends the invitation. And as we gather, we focus in on what it's all about. We don't just let our minds wander around and, and fix on everything else. Well, you know, we got to get out of here. I mean, the Baptist is going to beat me to Bob Evans. And, and you know, and I, I'm going to have to stand on the back of the line at Golden Corral. You know, come on, hurry it up. You know what? There's a better table to be at today, my friend. Better table to be at focus on the significance of what happened. With all that said, with the fact that God told Paul about it, and he's relating it to us, and we may not have all the bad issues of the Corinthian church going on, but you know what? We're prone to them. It could happen here in your life. There, but for the grace of God, go we. I have good news. Jesus invites you to the table today because he is worthy. He laid down his life's blood. His body was broken. He was, as Isaiah said, wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement, the beating, they were upon him. By the stripes across his back, we are healed. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup and discern it was Jesus that did it for me, you're to do so until he comes back for you. Through the grave or through the clouds, doesn't matter. He's coming back for his own. Would you stand with me, please? As the worship team returns, our invitation will be in the pews today, right where you are, as the brethren come to serve you these emblems. We're going to pray for... And as these symbols of his broken body and his shed blood are passed in front of you, 
examine yourself before they get there. If there's anything that you feel entitled to, lay it before the Lord right now, because you're not.